Oh man, I just have such a great game. I also have some deck changes to uh, go over with you. If you have been following the tapped out link, I do update those as I'm making changes and it will often be in between videos. So there's a way that you could get uh, current deck list uh, in general, although you won't get the, the list I'm in the middle of testing. Um, so until I feel like those changes are worth locking in. Um, unfortunately, recently I purchased uh, I purchased a card that I think is an amazing card in its colors, one of the best, the um, Colgan's Command, um, but it's it was a bit too difficult for me to consistently play the card because it was too off-color, um, double off-color in the deck. Um, and having decided that Notion Thief wasn't reliably, like it's not consistent enough, Notion Thief, the problem I was having with Notion Thief was twofold. Um, so first of all, I love the combo, but secondly, uh, you know, hit, hitting him with Dak Faden with Notion Thief or Cephalid Coliseum was just, there's probably nothing as satisfying as that. But um, the problem with it was twofold. So first, I did not like the fact that it was a creature in a deck that runs very, very few creatures. It means that my opponent, who's generally stranded with removal in their hand and no way to use it effectively, suddenly has a target, one that they can clearly identify as a threat, and they will immediately kill the thief. Uh, versus something like, say, Stoneforge Mystic, where once he's in play, in the opponent's eyes, he's already done his job. Um, they often allow him to stay, which means he starts generating mana, when he puts a, a Sword of Feast and Famine into play for two rather than three, and he uh, potentially can then equip that sword and hit my opponent, all I need is a proper window to do so, and that um, makes Stoneforge a much better threat than um, Notion Thief as a comparison. So that was problem one with Notion Thief. Problem two was that much like me, many of the best decks out there actually have ways to get cards in their hand that don't involve drawing. In fact, the majority of ways that this deck puts cards in its hands actually are not true draws in the sense of of what the game considers to be a draw effect. So for example, if you run the Lantax scroll rack combo, scroll rack is not actually a draw effect. It's a it's a it's an exchange. So it doesn't trigger Notion Thief. If you get out Necropotence or Demont, uh, Dark Confidant, that Neither of those are actual draws, so they don't trigger Notion Thief. If you were to say Factor Fiction, not a draw, not an Ocean Thief. Future Sight, same problem. Um, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny little handful of cards that it does affect, the most common of which being Sensei's Divining Top, but running a, a, a valuable slot for one card like that doesn't feel very good. And when I didn't have the combo, all I had was a 3-1 doing nothing, saying, hey, I really wish I could be helpful here um, if he wasn't dying on the spot. So I ended up cutting him. I like him. There's a place for him. It's probably not this deck, however. Um, I guess he had a, a fourth uh, a problem, too, is that this deck does want to play Humility fairly often against quite a few um, different opponents out there. And then Notion Thief was just straight up garbage. 1-1 uh, one, one flash for 4. Uh, with no abilities was uh, not a card that I was um, interested in playing. So I took that out and I took out Colgan's Command. And because I took Notion Thief out, I was able to, and actually this this is another strike against Notion Thief now that I think about it. I was able to switch the Cephalid Coliseum out and put uh, Steam Vents in. So I actually took a red card out and made my red mana even better. Um, kind of funny how that works, but I'm happier with the mana base now. It has all of the dual lines I want two of all of the blue ones, one of all of the white ones, and the single Badlands as a, a hedge fetch, plus the triple islands for um, Lantax. Uh, the mana base is just absolutely perfect. You've still got Urborg, you've got Wasteland, Strip Mine, Ancient Tomb, um, uh, Mishra's Workshop, and a bunch of, you know, what, City of Brass, Command Tower, and uh, Spire of Industry, Mana Confluence. So you've got basically four Cities of Brass, four Insane Lands, and a very, very, very flexible suite of uh, mana selections working wonderfully. So anyway, um, so what did I put in? I put in Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time. So these cards are restricted in Vintage. That should be a tip-off uh, that they're quite powerful. Now, it doesn't always translate properly. Um, restrictions and Vintage don't always translate because on occasion, the reason a card is restricted in Vintage is that 
the interaction with the rest of the cards in Vintage makes it amazing, whereas in other formats, it's not, not so much. So a perfect example of that would be um, Chalice of the Void is restricted in Vintage because often it's, it, it turns a game into who wins the dice roll. Um, you, win the di you win the die roll, you dump all your moxes and your lotus into play, and then you play Chalice on zero, and then they're sitting there with a handful of moxes and lotus and they can't keep up with you in mana. Um, that seems like a really stupid gimmick to have as a four of. As a one of, okay, maybe I can force a will it, but as a four of, it's pretty much um, not fun. No one was interested in having the format continue that way, and that's a good example of a card that um, makes perfect sense to restrict in Vintage, but I, you know, clearly I'm not running it here, and most people would not be running it in uh, Commander or pretty much any other format, not at that level. So these, on the other hand, in a deck specifically with 10 fetch lands and Ponder Preordain, all of the cheap little tutors that go and fetch cards, Impulse and Brainstorm and all those good stuff. Plus, this deck also has Dak Faden to uh, pour cards into your graveyard. And it has Factor Fiction to do so as well. I think this might actually be what I was looking for in the first place. It's really funny to come back to these restricted cards, but when they were first printed, I was playing them in Oloro, and I didn't have as many of those things, and it didn't make as much sense in the Oloro deck. Plus, Oloro runs two Dark Confidant effects, and when you flip one of these to a Dark Confidant, it's a pretty feel-bad moment, even for Oloro, to uh, take eight, uh, eight damage. And I had a game, I was looking at, you know, I had a game where I actually took uh, eight and then flipped Karn on the next one and seven and I, I took 15 and um, was able to lose a game to a, a red deck um, and that, but that was in a Laurel where I was running both Dark Confidant on, and Dark Tutelage and I believe in that game may have had well I had one or both out so in this deck where we don't have as many and we have more ways to fire them off and also um, Oloro's commander tended to draw cards it was his kind of backup play it was you know, you had too much mana, you just played a Laurel, and then you start drawing extra cards and get your way out of that. Uh, this commander does amazing things, but one thing he doesn't do really effectively is draw cards, so you can run out of gas. These um, help ensure that you don't. So those are the changes I made, and I've got to show you a game that I just... I, I, I This game, I felt so extremely thrilled about... Um, the way that this played out. Oh, incidentally, since I made the changes with the um, with the uh, delve cards, oops, didn't mean to go through all that. How do we get back to the game? I uh, I have not lost yet, which is a good sign. But I only have about 20 games or so, so that's not particularly. Uh, let's wait till we get to like 100, and then we'll get a better sense of where we're at. Because we want the win ratio to be. Um, for for me, uh, a deck is doing what it's supposed to do when your win ratio is somewhere around 95% against the general field and then when you play against um, another super tuned um, str strong player with a great deck with all the tools to beat you then you should be shooting over 50 percent is what you're shooting for but against the general public it should be something like uh you know over 95 so that's that's kind of like my just after a couple of thousand games of Commander. That's kind of what I've 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 come to um, based on specifically the numbers that um, that I can see in my win win loss ratio. So anyway, my opponent is playing Rafik and I'm playing um, Bray, of course. And I have this situation where I was trying to decide if I want to keep this. And the thing about this hand that made me decide I wanted to keep it was I had a couple of things going on. First of all, um, first of all, I have. Uh, a vampiric tutor that I can play early, which means I could potentially go get. Um, I can go. I can set up for a humility. See if I, if the, if I go black white land ancient tomb hallowed fountain, I can go get humility, which may just beat this player. Um, another thing I can do with uh, vampiric tutor here is I was thinking about I have Karn and I've got shop and tomb. So if I've got some time, I could vampiric tutor for gilded lotus, get down um, a gilded lotus really quickly, potentially playing my commander to prevent myself from dying to. Um, Rafik, and then follow it up with uh, Karn and do really good things. And lastly, I have early Soaring Defense. So even though this hand doesn't have any counters and it's a little bit awkward, uh, considering I'm going first, it felt like it was probably fine to keep. I thought, but for some reason in my head, I was going first and I wasn't. So this hand got significantly worse because now I don't get to go first turn vamp. I'm going to be, that Lotus is like four turns away. That's not really fast. A shop in a tomb should make it in two turns. 
um, a vampiric, if I have to vamp uh, on turn one and I'm going first, the Lotus will come down on my opponent's second turn. Um, he would have two lands in play tapped, and then he would take his third turn. But but now it's coming down on his third turn. My fourth, that's pretty slow. And he leads off with a um, Avison's Pilgrim. So we're, let's get to a little bit more of the gameplay here. This game was absolutely amazing. And then I don't, my deck's not cooperating as far as top decking goes. It's not giving me anything useful. So I figured, okay, well, maybe this will just be a go get um, humility game. And then my opponent plays Sylvan Library. And Mother Runes, which is fine. I suppose Karn can deal with that. Um, but I have to get that Sylvan Library off the table right now. And so I go ahead and fetch Badlands because there's always the possibility that he's going to get a, a artifact like a Fire and Ice or something. So I, I really, I, I, as much as I didn't like to go get the Badlands, this is exactly why Badlands is in the deck. Um, to have this flexibility to be able to go get um, a Black Source while still retaining the ability to play a red card. So I have to vamp for Disenchant. In my opinion, um, Sylvan Library is way, 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 way too good. Um... Of all the cards in the format that scare me, uh, Sylvan is right up there at the top because it's so extremely hard for you to stop, particularly if you're going second. Um, even like Necropotence, as scary as it is, it's it's scarily OP. At least it's it's a challenge to get it into play, but Sylvan Library is just ridiculous. Anyway, um, okay, so I do Toxic Deluge, which is huge because that's generally a tutor target. And I decide the play here is going to be to go ahead and just... So here's what I'm thinking. I drew Toxic Deluge, so I'm figuring I'm gonna um if I play blue untapped, I can um I can telegraph that I have a counter spell and try to bluff. Uh, or I could play Ancient Tomb in the hopes that the next turn I draw a great artifact and then possibly ramp into Karn on the next turn. Um but I decide I'm gonna play Hallowed Fountain because I drew Deluge to put shields down to make it clear that like I don't have a counter spell. Because what I want him to do on the next turn is play land and then cast his commander and hit me for some extra damage with maybe Pilgrim or whatever, so that I can deluge and clean up the board. And then I think figure I'm in a pretty good spot from there. Um, and if I'm really lucky, I'll draw a counter spell. So I'll draw a counter spell, I'll play Ancient Tomb, use the Badlands in the tomb to deluge, clear his board out, have a counter, and then I probably win the game. So I'm going to try to trick him into playing his commander. He's having none of that. So he, end of turn, uh, Demonic Tutor for a creature. And the creature he goes and get is Eternal Witness. Well, it's Aladdin Murray's call, but it's the same same effect. At instant speed. So he goes and gets Eternal Witness, which means now I have to deal with that friggin' Sylvan Library again. And I kind of wish I had the Tomb in play now, only because there would be a chance that I could draw a decent mana rock like... um. And, and actually play Karn and kill the uh, Sylvan right away. But, um, all right. So right now I'm in a big, big trouble because he is not playing the Rafik game or she. My opponent's playing the Sylvan Library game, and that's a game I don't want to get into a fight with. So I was thinking about what to do here. I drew Impulse, right? So um, I do have Vindicate in the deck. Um... And with no other information to go off of, that's kind of one of my best hopes to try to deal with the Sylvan immediately. So I decide the play here is Ancient Tomb Impulse. Um, alternately, I could go get, um, I could potentially pick up something that will, um, that will uh, uh, reward me for having, you know, the, uh, I may be able to like ramp up here and, um, and then play card next turn and deal with Sylvan and, and just lose a turn on it. So I was looking at, these are my options. There's a Tazeret, um, War of Invention, Command Tower, Treasure Cruise. It's not going to be Command Tower, but out of the other three, what do you take here? Certainly, um, if you said Tezzeret or War, I could see that. Um, Tezzeret over War, actually. Um, because one of the ways to stop... Uh, a deck who's drawing a ton of cards is to pinch their mana so they have a bunch of cards they can't cast. And Tezzeret's ability to fetch winter orb could be pretty valuable here. But I decide I'm actually going to um, take the treasure cruise instead. And I'm actually end up one mana shy of being able to cruise right now. So I've got it's eight mana and I've got four in the graveyard, one floating, five, six, seven. It's just not going to work. So I could deluge here as an alternate plan. And then follow it up with like a cruise or whatever. Um, but I decide that I, I still, I'm worried about Rafik. And this really isn't a lot of value. The Witness has already drawn an extra card. And these two cards don't make much of a difference. So I'm going to sit on the Deluge for a little while longer. And really hope that Merva there doesn't find a Wasteland or a Strip Mine. 
to take a little damage. I was again. I, I'm hoping that you know the the play for this player is cast a commander, hit me for like four, and pass a turn. Oh no, it gets much worse than that. Crucible gets a free land. Skull clamp. So now this player has three different non-creature onboard sources sources of continuous card advantage for which I do have Vandal Blast if I can get up to the point where I can blast, but it's going to be kind of too little too late by that point. So that Eternal Witness was the most insane creature ever because it uh, drew target card plus uh, two others. All right, so my opponent ends the turn. Um, and I've got Trinket Mage. This is not... So, all right, so this is such a hard spot to be in. I could Vandal Blast away the cru the Crucible and the Clamp, and that's pretty reasonable. I could... Um, again, Deluge is on the table as an option. I can try to work my way into a Cruise somehow. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to figure out exactly how that would work. But... Yeah, I suppose I could hard cast it for a. It's a gnarly. It's not a. It's not a cheap one, but um, I decide that I need to develop. The only way I'm going to get that Sylvan off the table is Karn, and I've got to get the stupid Sylvan Library off the table. So I'm going to develop here instead. I'm going to Trinket Mage, and I I do want to cruise. However, I need options for next turn, which means I need two things. I need both mana and cards. So this is the way I intend to get that Trinket Mage for Soul Ring. Since I have a shop in my hand, I can use the shop to play the Ring. And then we're going to cruise up, and hopefully, maybe I'll even get lucky. I could hit Winter Orb right here, or I could hit some Artifact Mana right here. I don't, but I hit two counters and the blue mana to make blue, 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 blue. Well, no, I'm one short. Okay, but I hit two counters and a blue mana, and I'll take that. My opponent is Sylvaning again, and because they're already sitting on Crucible Clamp... Um, they have Crucible to shuffle away what they don't want and Clamp to find new cards. They elect not to pay the life to take the two cards, which is fine by me. Don't pay the life as much as possible, please. Uh, their leadoff is Quizali Pride Mage. So the Soul Ring, I really needed the Soul Ring to stay. Quizali Pride Mage is Disenchant, draw three cards. This is just so absurd. Like, I, I, I have no idea. Like, how am I supposed to win against this kind of card advantage? X equals three on that, and they go and get Knight of the uh, Reliquary. So there's some serious threat going on here. Knight is going to be able to sack a land, um, get bigger in the process, and go fetch a uh, strip mine and cut off my red uh, or take out my ancient tomb. And in at any case, it's going to be quite bad. So at this point, I have to pull the trigger on Deluge, and I draw, I rip a talisman, and uh, thank goodness it's a talisman here. I'm able to play. Um, watery grave untapped and because um, I'm, I'm going to deluge anyway and I'm pretty sure that he's this person's willing to take two damage and not risk um, any kind of weird trick I might have regardless of them having mother of runes of course I send in and I'm fortunate in that they decide to play it safe um, two life matters though it's half a card with sylvan so I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, get whatever I can out of this uh, trinket mage and follow up with deluge for three uh, opponent tries to give uh, knight pro black. Of course, it gets pro black and then dies. And now I actually have a chance in the game. My opponent is beating the heck out of me with cards. But the day, the um, treasure cruise helped a little bit. Uh, having picked up three cards, it actually made up for uh, one activation of Sylvan and one activation of Skull Clamp. So I'm only behind by three cards now. Uh, half an activation of Skull Clamp. So I'm behind by three cards. I'm behind on mana. Of course, he's going to get even more cards from Crucible. Let's face it, I'm way behind. <laughs> All right, so opponent Sylvans again uh, does not pay, which is very strange. Gets the free fetch, but I imagine maybe if the top cards were land, 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 I suppose I wouldn't have paid either, not with a Crucible out. There'll be more cards to look at soon. When it plays Land of War Elves, I'm not fighting over Land of War Elves. It's, it's, it's draw two, but there's really not a lot I can do there. Now, last turn I did have the option to Vandal Blast away the Skull Clamp. So, like, I could have paid with black and then left this one, and then Vandal Blast away and not sat on two counters. But I felt like that would be a bad play. Um, because the only way I see getting back into the game is the v possibly vain hope. That my opponent might makes a big play and I mana drain it. And they are playing blue, which means they could have a counter to back it up and would 
if they have a counter to back it up, they'll probably feel confident enough to make that big play. And the only way I can win that is with double counters. So that's why I didn't do that. Well, first of all. Secondly, um, if I do make a big mana drain play, I could potentially Vandal Blast and clear both artifacts that are giving me a problem leaving just the Sylvan, which Karn will hopefully take care of at some point. There's a lot of ifs and probably and hopefullys, but that's all I have right now. So my opponent clamps elves and does nothing. Plays it safe. I mean, they've got seven cards in hand, Sylvan Crucible running. There's no reason for them to do anything. And I drew, and I thought about here, I could go Vandal Blast with a counter backup, but I drew Mystical Teachings, and I don't I don't like the way that that line plays out because then, then I'm open to all kinds of abuse on their turn. So I'm just going to do nothing as well and see what they've got. They cycle Secluded Step. I was really glad that that wasn't a um, end of turn flash or instant that I would have had to have considered fighting over. Um which would have been a problem for me. All right, so opponent Sylvans uh, doesn't pay life again, uh, again for almost certainly the same reasons. Um, plays their lands, uh, plays this out of hand and tucks the card that was on top. I, I don't think that's better than sacking a Marsh Flats, but perhaps they're out of Marsh Flats is an off color, so perhaps they're out of planes to fetch. And finally goes for a big play. And this is what I've been needing to happen. So um, perfect world. I get to mana drain this. And then I get to mystical teachings. So we are going to try. And my opponent does have a backup. So if I hadn't left double blue up. Um, I could have been very much. Like if I had gone for the Vandal Blast play. I could have just lost the game. Uh, fortunately I have Deprive back in the deck here. So I just Deprive picking up Workshop. Get my five mana, and then he's done. All right, so during upkeep, I mystical teaching. So I don't know if you figured out what the line here is, but uh, I'm going to get five mana coming, and it is exactly what I need. So mystical teachings goes and gets enlightened tutor. Enlightened tutor goes and gets winter orb. I've got five mana exactly. Five and two is seven. Misha's workshop is orb. I kill his, um, first of all, I kill his um, Crucible. Even though I have Vandal Blast, I figured, and he's got Sylvan, um, 21 life, they're, they're a little bit low on life. If they if they untap and then pay with Sylvan a bunch of life to draw um, some cards, maybe hitting a land, after that, they're probably not going to be able to use it too much. But if they have Crucible out, they get to untap Sylvan for to look for um, creatures and then Crucible over and over to uh, to crawl out from under the orb lock. I don't like that, so I plan to do this now and then we'll Vandal Blast that clamp as soon as possible and kill the Sylvan as soon as possible as well. But also, like, um, the nice thing about Brea is that, um, so I've got two of the colors I need immediately following the orb and in two turns I could potentially play Brea and that um, Brea pressures life totals very well so you can't sylvan just willy-nilly completely against me although in this position if i were that person i would have but instead they give up so i just freaking beat um the most insane card disadvantage ever look at this almost 10 cards difference in our libraries and a seven well if the opponent paid two extra life um this this person would have had or 10 cards, 9 cards differences in hand, a 9 card difference. So this person literally has 9 extra cards available to them. 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, as technically is 3 more. But 9 extra cards available to them, and somehow I managed to pull that one out. I, I couldn't believe that I won this game. I was... I actually had like music playing or something in the background and I had to stop partway through um, when my opponent played Clamp, Sylvan and the other thing, uh, Crucible. I had to turn everything off because I could. I had to focus so hard on trying to figure out how to win this game. So it felt really, really good to, uh, to manage to pull that one out. And um, hopefully it also was very entertaining and, uh, and that you enjoyed watching um, and seeing uh, one of the new cards in action, the Treasure Cruise. Definitely not a new card. Um, it's been kicking butt in formats for a while now. But it was just a lot of fun to have a game where I made a change. And that change seems to have been for the good. So 
Um, that's all I've got now. Um, I will throw this final warning. Watch out with cruise and dig. Don't walk into a mana drain. And always keep in mind, um, although Dark Confidant's um, average cost here is about two and a half on any given card that you flip, always keep in mind that you, you could potentially take eight. So watch your life totals with those. And with that in mind, hopefully this will be some of the last changes that take place. Um, I think it may be until the next set, but I keep saying that um, and I keep I keep tuning. But it feels real, real tight. Um, the one thing on my wish list for this build that I don't have that I would very much like to have had in here um, since I can't play Colligans and it's too expensive, the other card that I'd really like to have a lot is Anguished on Making. Then on that turn where I actually um, impulsed, I would have had two possible connects to remove my opponent's Sylvan Library rather than one. Um, so if anyone has any thoughts on how to get Anguish on Making back into the deck, I'd love to hear them because it's certainly a card that would be excellent in here. Um, however, I don't currently see a way to do that and I don't think it's necessary but it'd be nice anyway that's all I've got thanks for watching I'll see you next time